Hello and welcome. I'm Bob Campbell and this is The Real Review, Gold Ribbon Wines for 2020. Just to, I'm going to start with a reminder, if you want to order wines and replay tastings after this event, uh, you can go to our website and, and click on events and then go to cellar door to door. Uh, we hear many of you have ordered from wineries and uh, that's great. Otherwise, uh, open a bottle and just sip along uh, uh, and enjoy. Uh, I like to have an interactive format as much as I possibly can. So you can ask questions via Q&A and I'll taste two wines uh, and then answer questions after every pair of wines and then we'll go on to. So four, four times will give us four opportunities to, uh, uh, to ask and answer questions. We've got eight gold ribbon wines here, four from New Zealand and four from Australia. It's not a competition. Uh, we're not, uh, the, it's not the Bledisloe Cup or anything like that. It's, it's, uh, it's really a compare and contrast and, and really focus on, uh, on what are the qualities that a gold my, a wine has when it uh, gets a, a, an accolade such as gold ribbon. Um, we've got to ask what is the difference between a gold and a silver, a silver ribbon wine? And it can be very little uh, and, and sometimes can be debatable too. Um, a gold ribbon wine should just tick all the boxes. It should have intensity, complexity, a great texture, identity, uh, a sense of identity, length, uh, and, uh, uh, and, and, not, and be re, re, free of, of obvious faults. Um, it should also have the X factor. I think often there's, there's, there's wines you can, you can taste and you don't know why, but instantly it, it, you just know this is a gold medal wine. It, it, it's not hard work at all. It just jumps out. Absolutely top stuff. Um, gold medal wines, uh, I do a lot of spitting through the day <laughs> and uh, uh, they should tempt me to swallow rather than spit. I have to resist the urge, of course, in the interests of uh, coherent tasting notes, but uh, um, uh, but the, the temptation is always there. Um, one thing that I'm occasionally asked about uh, wine judging is is how do we do we factor in do we judge what a wine will will be or do we crystal ball gaze? And I, the answer to that is not really. But if you have a young wine, you judge it as a young wine. You 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 uh, it's got. Uh, you forgive it for its the the, the uh, uh, energy of youth and uh, and, um, uh, and 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 judge it accordingly. So we certainly take that into account. I certainly take that into account. Uh, different judges have different have slightly different uh, 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 approaches to to the, to the uh, assessment of wines. But um, uh, I, I think the, the wine show system in Australia and New Zealand really gives us discipline when most of us have gone through that and gives us discipline and, uh, and uh, uh, that's a good thing. That's uh, consistency. Now we're going to, I'm going to start with um, uh, the non-vintage Cloudy Bay Pelorus Rosé, which is a perfect place to start because I'm speaking in a, a, a muggy, you may be in Auckland as well, but a muggy Auckland evening. And to me, a nice chilled bottle of, of, of Rosé Method uh, is just the antidote we need. Now you notice I've sealed this with a um, a cap, one of those. If you want to keep leftover sparkling wine, it keeps quite well. You, you need one of these things. Don't use a silver teaspoon; they don't work. That's an absolute myth. Um, so uh, avoid silver teaspoons. And let's have a look. I um, I remember when I first bought a set of flutes. I would pour the the wine into them, the sparkling wine into them, and and uh, and they they appeared to have no bubbles. They didn't seem to show bubbles at all. And I discovered that the the glasses were too fault free on the in, on the inside, and they need a fault to to seed on to produce that lovely string of pearls that we can see in in sparkling wine. So I just simply got a sharp knife and put a little scratch in every glass, and uh, and now they 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 look splendid. Uh, nice. Pale, uh, pale pink color. That's uh, a, a very appealing color. It gets us off to a good start. Um, it's a blend of, of Pinot Noir and Chardonnay, a sort of classic champagne blend of grape varieties. And this wine spent two years in the bottle on the East Lees. Uh, now, they, they are obviously 
my assessment of it anyway is that they want to capture a little bit of fruit from the from the grapes, uh, but also give that a little influence of, of, of yeastiness as well. Just it's a nice balance but between the two. I should say a delicate balance between the two. Uh, so two years is, is, is quite enough. Cl Cloudy Bay is, is one of the, uh, first, was one of the first five winemakers to set up camp in, uh, in Marlborough, which is interesting. I know people don't know that, been around for quite a while. And it's owned by <coughs> the luxury goods uh, uh, company, French company, LVMH, which also owns Verve Clicquot, Ruinard, Moat and Chandon, Krug and Dom Perignon. So I would imagine with that sort of, uh, with those uh, uh, close cousins, a little bit of technical uh, know-how would have slipped into uh, Cloudy Bay. Uh, I, uh, I certainly, certainly the wines don't taste like champagne. They taste like really good uh, New Zealand or Marlborough uh, sparkling wines. But, uh, oh, I should mention LMVH can't mention can't just mention just the sparkling one. They've also got uh, Chateau Yquem, Cheval Blanc, and Cape Mintel among others. So um, uh, Cloudy Bay are in very very good company. Well, let's let's um, let me try this wine now. Uh, mm. Well, that was a, a temptation to swallow, I must admit, but I managed to managed to come through with flying colours. Um, it's uh, uh, lo lovely, just th those little nuances of strawberry and raspberry, and that that goes back to just a touch of I call it baguette crust, that sort of crusty, fresh baguette character. Um, a, a really, I think a, a a a good test for for sparkling wine is is once the wine is gone, once it's been spat or swallowed, uh, just how does the texture, how, how you can measure the texture in the mouth. And this is really ethereal, round and smooth, um, fresh, soft wine with character and, and a nice amount of acidity with, um, with just a hint of, of sweetness that really doesn't come, um, come across at all, but, but keeps that acidity uh, under control. I gave that 95 points, it's uh, a gold ribbon, and it ranks number two out of 19 method wines uh, from Marlborough. The food match for this, well, my food match would be freshly shucked toy point oysters with a, just, a, just a squeeze of lime, that's how I like them. And, uh, and, and, and it's a perfect antidote for this weather, as I said, on a, uh, on a day like, uh, like we, we, we've, uh, we've had today. Wonderful stuff. Now we move to a Sauvignon Blanc from Blank Canvas in Marlborough, and that has a retail price of $28. Um, this is the product of winemaker rock stars, Matt Thompson and Sophie Parker Thompson, their husband and wife. Um, Matt is a consultant to, uh, was a consultant to St. Clair for many years, and he's a flying winemaker that he continually wings his way around the the uh, the globe uh, uh, helping helping others uh, uh, fine tune their winemaking uh, and uh, and 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 in, and at the same time uh, uh, learning much about the world of wine himself. Um, I'm just getting my grandchildren quietened down there. You may have heard a little bit of noise there. Apologies for that. Um, I, I like. Uh, Oh, Sophie is, is finishing off her Master of Wine exam, so she's uh, 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 pretty serious about, uh, about wine. Uh, the, I like their slogan that I found on their website, wines made without recipes. Uh, I think that's rather nice. Uh, I, I'd hate to think what food would taste like if I failed to use a recipe when I was cooking. Uh, but but my wife, who's, who's much more experienced than I uh, as a cook, um, as she uh, uh, doesn't need a uh, often need a recipe and can can wing it because she knows how food foods and interact and how the, what the outcome will be and I think I think it's the same with with Matt you know he's he's got he's such an experienced fellow that he can um, uh, you know he can he can 
manage without a, a formula. Um, the, 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 oh, let's, uh, no, he'd rather make wines. That, that's the other thing. He said, I'd rather make wines that some people will love than wines that everyone will like. Uh, I think that's rather nice. Uh, the Sauvignon Blanc there is, is grown in uh, uh, the vineyards in Dillon's Point area, which is close to the coast in, in Marlborough and with quite rich fertile soils. And they tend to produce wines with intensity and, and, and richness itself. It sort of goes along, along with uh, hand in hand. So let's now, I'm dying to try this blank canvas, another good antidote for Oh gosh! Oh, there we go. Another good antidote for uh, Auckland humidity. I'm quite a fan of uh, of Sauvignon Blancs. Uh, it seems to be fashionable these days to uh, to say I don't I don't don't uh, like Sauvignon Blanc, but I do. Um, uh, I think it's great, and, and especially through summer and with certain foods, it's uh, almost compulsory. Um, let's have a look. You may think it's slightly odd me using Riedel Pinot Noir glasses for uh, a white wine, uh, but um, it, it really gives them a good aeration. This is what I use to taste all wines. So it's a level playing field. And, and it, with a, a few swirls, you can really aerate the wine and, and, and turn a snapshot into a slight movie and, and get a better appreciation for the wine. Um, this is a really uh, punchy Sauvignon. With, it's got, it's got nice power and and I'm getting passion fruit, green capsicum, uh, a little bit of box hedge, that's the French call it, we call it, tend to call it a bit of armpit here, um, and some some saline mineral characters which I which I really like. Uh, it's appropriate to have uh, those saline sort of oyster shell uh, characters with a coastal location. I don't know whether it picks it up, the vines pick it up through the through the through the soil or 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 somehow through the air, but it's uh, it's a lovely feature of this wine. I love the acidity. It's it's slightly edgy, um, uh, but the but the wine is bone dry, and and many Sauvignons aren't. I find it quite frustrating to have that little residual sugar at the end if it's if it's over if it's, it's overdone. It's uh, it's not my style. Um, the uh, I gave this 95 points and it's ranked number five out of 56 2020 Sauvignon Blancs from Marlborough. 2020 uh, is a jolly good vintage. It's um, 2019 and 20, both a pair of cracker vintages. In 2020, I'm told, it probably is probably the, the stronger vintage. They were both very hot drought years, but there was a little bit more, more uh, underground water in uh, in 2020, so so they, the wines uh, responded to that. Um, there's a food match here. Uh, Matt and when asked to give a food match to this wine, Matt and Sophie uh, rose to the occasion with this with this uh, comment. They said, "Our ideal food match for this wine: uh, any dishes that focus on ripe fruits such as mango, black currant, passion fruit, grapefruit, and anything with a hint of saltiness will bring out the flavors in the wine." We like freshly shucked oysters with grapefruit granita. I'm not even sure what granita is. I thought it was your breakfast cereal, but uh, uh, it sounds, sounds interesting, and I'm certainly going to, uh, uh, to, to give it a go. Right. Now, oh, we've got time now for questions. Oh, wait, we've got questions too. Roughly what percentage of wines attain a gold medal that you taste? Gosh, you know, I haven't done the I haven't done the math on that, but I could do, and I'll have to get back to you. I don't know what the answer is there. I know in in um, in wine competitions, it's usually around about five percent, something like that. But I don't know what it, I haven't I haven't looked at mine. Does it take a winery a long time to get up to gold ribbon status, maturity of the vines, etc.? Well, not not at all. Um, uh, some wineries seem to hit the ground running uh, and uh, uh, and even even with with grapevines you'd expect the with with vine age the, for the quality of the wine to 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 progress and get better 
Uh, but um, often, sometimes the f there's been many examples of the first uh, crop that they took off young vines was the best fruit that they ever had. Something to do with the fruit to leaf ratio. Uh, so it's it's not it's not uncommon for the the first shot to be the best shot or to be a very good shot anyway. So it's qu quite. Uh, um, but but m more typical, I suppose, would be the gradual the gradual climb in quality as uh, as the vines get a little bit of age and as the winemaker gets a bit of experience and and learns to get the best out of this of, of that site. Uh, we've got another one here. I've had recently. I have had recently. I've recently had Sauvignon Blanc from France, and they taste really different from Marlborough. Why is that? Well, they're different countries. Um, different climate, different uh, soils, and, and a different philosophy too. Um, so, so there, there is a, there is a, uh, um, uh, you know, a, a very interesting example. Uh, Henri Bourgeois uh, makes has makes extremely good Sancerre in uh, in in Sancerre, and uh, you can buy it from uh, Maison Veron in Auckland, uh, and. Uh, and he's he's so enthusiastic about about great Sauvignon that he's he bought a um, Clo Henri. He bought a, a set up a brand Clo Henri in 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 Marlborough. He's not trying to make Sancerre in Marlborough. He's not even trying to make Sancerre-ish Marlborough Sauvignon. He's trying to make very good Marlborough Sauvignon and succeeding, I might say. But the wines are very different because of the of the of the site differences. And that's. Uh, what it all boils down to in the end. Okay, well, let me move on now to uh, wine number three, which is Isabel Estate, uh, Vineyard Chardonnay uh, from Marlborough, and that's uh, Australia $35. And I'll explain in a minute why, why I've quoted an Australian price for a New Zealand wine. Uh, uh, Isabel was a very early Marlborough vineyard, uh, started by Mike Tiller, who's a pilot. And a, as the legend goes, he was flying across the across the Wairau Valley when he, he when there was a frost, and he spotted um, an area that 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 wasn't frosted. Uh, so obviously a warmer area than than surrounding uh, land. And as a result, he bought he bought that site and named it after his mother, I believe. Is, uh, uh, Isabel, um, and he planted that in the 1980s. Or I think it first planted it in 1980 when he, he put in some Chardonnay vines. Um, in 94, uh, he made his first wine. In between times, he'd been selling his grape crop to uh, producers, and then he, he uh, in 1994, he uh, he made his wine under his own label. It's always a high performer. I have I think back at some of those. There were some very, very top wines from uh, from Isabel. I think of Chardonnay has been a, a great success for them, but Sauvignon too, and and other Pinot Noir as well. I, I vaguely remember uh, in '94. The um, in sorry in nineteen in two thousand and fourteen, Isabel was bought by Pinnacle Drinks, and they've got the head office in Sydney, and that's why most of the wines tends to. Uh, Go across the Tasman, and we, it's it's not it's not something you see very uh, often on wine shop or supermarket shelves in this country. Uh, 2018 was a low yielding, quite a wet vintage, not a not an easy easy vintage, but um, uh, but uh, often produced concentration perhaps through the low yield. Uh, this was mostly wild yeast fermented and all in barrel. Um, Let's have a look. I think I might have got a fruit fly on that. That was just a little.
That's a very um, a sophisticated wine. Um, I'm getting uh, some nice uh, underlying fruit, um, citrus, perhaps grapefruit, uh, peach, white peach, um, nectarine possibly, and 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 there's some a little bit of smoky sulfidey sort of fireworks, just a nuance there that that uh, adds a bit of complexity to the wine, really makes it in a way. Um, it's also got some, some yeast uh, uh, character there. I think ginger I'm getting and probably, uh, and some slight nuttiness. Uh, and there's a touch of spicy oak. Quite, it's quite, actually it's quite Burgundian in style. Um, quite complex, very complete, very, very balanced, very together. Uh, and very, very nice to uh, to drink. Another one that uh, I have to uh, remind myself not to not to swallow. Um, I gave this uh, 95 points, and it ranked number five out of 53 uh, 2018 Marlborough Chardonnays. So that's a, a a good performance. When the winemaker was asked what he would match with this, uh, he replied he replied lobster roll, which is interesting. I love lobster. Uh, and I can see how lobster would go very well with this, but I'm not absolutely sure what a lobster roll is, but um, perhaps I'll find out and, and, and give it a shot. <laughs> it sounds intriguing. Right. Next wine on the agenda is 2000, and we're going to across the across the Tasman, 2017 Thompson Estate, the Specialist Chardonnay, uh, which is uh, uh, in Margaret River, uh, and it carries a, a price tag of, of Australian dollars, 80. Um, the vineyard's in Willyabrup, uh, which is quite a cool area right near south of Margaret River. Uh, and um, it produces, I've had some fantastic reasonings from, uh, from, from Willie Abrup uh, and, and, and Chardonnay. Um, it's, it's an area, in this case, the vineyard is surrounded by water on three sides, a little sort of peninsula that juts out into the, into the sea. So they would no doubt get some cooling effect from, uh, from, from that. First planted in 97 by cardiologist Peter Thompson. Uh, who, who believes that 2017 was a very good vintage, one of the best for the Thompson estate. So that's, uh, uh, that, that's good news for, a, for a, a quite a, a, high a very high performing uh, uh, a winery that uh, earns many accolades for all its wines, including the, including the Chardonnay. I quite like the package, actually. I don't know, I shouldn't get too carried away with packages, but I, I thought that was a, a rather elegant package. Um, uh, let's have a look at the taste. That's delicious, absolutely delicious. Really, um, really concentrated, and and somehow somehow very accessible. It's not, there's no it's 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 light in terms of ethereal, light in terms of soft, but but not light in terms of intensity. It's got lots and lots of flavour. Uh, I get grapefruit, passion fruit, really quite tropical, not subtle at all. And it's got, although it's got fruit sweetness uh, it, and alcohol sweetness, it, it's it's got enough acidity to give it a nice, nice dry mouth cleansing finish, which really appeals to me. Uh, it's it's great now. It's a it's a very uh, uh, accessible wine, um, but it, certainly no rush. I think this will, is going to deliver pleasure for many many years to come. Um, now, Hewan gave this 97 points and rated it num number three out of 106, 106 2017 Chardonnays from the Margaret River. And I totally endorse that um, enthusiastic score from, from Hewan. I, I, I think this is a, an absolutely super Australian Chardonnay that uh, 
um, really deserves to be uh, in the in the gold ribbon brigade. Uh, food match. Um, I've put my own food match here, and it's it's my uh, uh, roasted chicken drumsticks with lots of garlic and lemon. Uh, and having said, I don't I follow recipes. I don't follow the recipe too closely on this. I used to, but I. Uh, it's a family favourite and uh, and goes extremely well with with good Chardonnay and I think it would be a wonderful match with this lots of lemon and wonderful stuff. Um, now I'm ready for some more questions. If uh, um, uh, someone's there's a bit of a shock horror here, um, did I hear right? Did you scratch your champagne glasses uh, to? improve the sparkling bubbling seems like an expensive endeavor <laughs> well no. <laughs> yes I, you, you did hear right and uh, it's not an expensive endeavor at all it's um uh the, the wines the glasses are still fine i mean i use them every day and have been for probably 20 years uh that you can't there's no visible scratch but there is a a, a sort of micro a micro scratch i guess that that is just enough to to start the the, the, that stream of, of bubbles that looks so appealing. I think that's the thing with uh, with sparkling wine. It, it 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 appeals to all the senses. You know, we've got the sense of the sense of, of of smell, the sense of taste, the sense of of touch, the tactile sensation of of chilled liquid and, and bubbles. Um, uh, so it's it's, it's sort of uh, a very a very very sensual wine, and even and and the and the sense of sight, of course. The, the look of the uh, of the bubbles going up. So, so uh, I'm just giving it a hand to uh, uh, to satisfy all my uh, all my senses. And what else have we got? Another one here. Uh, what are the key differences in flavours between the Australian and New Zealand Chardonnay? Um, I think that's too general to really come up with any meaningful answer because uh, within New Zealand, uh, our long uh, uh, latitude and 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 within that huge uh, uh, country that is Australia, continent that's Australia, there are so many different different uh, styles of 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 Chardonnay that it, it, it's it's very hard to to just uh, compare the two to summarise in in a, in a few words the, the stylistic differences. Um, perhaps no, I. I, I you could narrow it down to regions and get closer, but the thing with Chardonnay is quite interesting. They, they, it, it's, it's, they talk about it being a, a blank canvas. Oh, we've got a blank canvas here. Uh, a blank canvas for the winemaker to, um, uh, to, to then build up layer, layers of nuances and so on with, with effectively paint. Um, but uh, uh, so, so it's, a, it's a high input a wine that gets a high input from the from the winemaker, and uh, uh, and and that's another big uh, a feature that dilutes the the influence of 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 region um, or even sub region. So it's a kind of a hard hard one to answer that. I'm sorry, I've just waffled my way through it. <laughs> All right, let's now move on to. Um, uh, the next wine, which is we're going to Pinot Noir now. Use another glass. And this is um, a 2018 hand-picked collection Pinot Noir from Mornington Peninsula. Uh, and it carries a price of Australian sixty dollars. Um, Handpicked is a, an interesting uh, organisation. They own six vineyards in Mornington, Yarra Valley, Tasmania, and the Barossa Valley, and they also work with a number of growers to produce wines that that uh, well, they say are handpicked and uh, are, are very typical of 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 those significant wine area, wine regions. Um, Mornington, this one's from Mornington Peninsula, which is a, a favorite Chardonnay Pinot Noir region for me anyway. 
It's about 50 kilometers southeast of Melbourne. Um, and uh, uh, the wine is, what else can we say about it? 100% de-stemmed and sorted by hand and spent nine months in oak. Um, so let's now have a taste. Here we go. It's not a, it's a, you know, I'd say medium to medium light color. Quite fragrant, right? Sort of a little bit of floral. Mm, fresh cherry berry flavors. Um, is it violet? So I'm getting certainly a floral lift there. A lovely texture. Um, hint of fresh herbs uh, makes it makes it much more interesting than it would otherwise be. I think it's, it's what I would describe as a high energy Pinot Noir. It's one that's that's um, got good acidity, good uh, vibrant, a vibrant, active wine. And I think they're the best for food. They're, they're uh, high energy wines. Really are. A, a very food friendly, and this would certainly be very food friendly. Um, the uh, Stuart Knox gave this 95 points, and I support Stuart on that, absolutely. Um, number five of 72 2018 Pinot Noirs from the Mornington Peninsula, so that's right up the top there. And for Food Match, this is quite an interesting one, uh, they claim. Peking duck and a ragu of wild mushrooms served with polenta, which sounds absolutely delicious. It made me my mouth water just to read it. And uh, and if there's a, a a low rumbling in the distance, it's you know what, exactly what that is. I I think that's a that's a d delicious food wine, and it would go really well with the with the duck. Still, uh, have managed to, to spit out, which is no small uh, achievement, really. Let's have a look. Now we're going to New Zealand Pinot Noir, rather different, uh, a different style of wine. This is the 2017 Pegasus Bay Pinot Noir from Wipra, uh, and it uh, uh, retails for New Zealand $52. Um, Pegasus Bay set up in Wipra, one of the early uh, pioneers there, 1986, which is going back from, from New Zealand's point of view. It's a family winery um, and uh, winemaker Matthew Donaldson, I just wrote about him recently and described him as a very hands-on, uh, uh, it's quite fashionable to call yourself a hands-off winemaker, but he's very hands-on. Uh, I guess he's uh, he likes to, he knows, he knows exactly what he wants and he likes to go out and get it and uh, um, has produced some some very uh, very good very innovative and and very individual wines as a result uh, i think this this is a sort of sort of pinot noir i've got to be careful when i say this but sort of pinot noir that 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 i think i could pick in a blind tasting i say be careful because somebody's going to put me to the test now but um it's got such a distinctive personality. Uh, it's Matthews uh, follows the traditions of Burgundian winemaking, and uh, he's a he's a Burgundy fan, and and um, and that, that shows through. The wine is, if I if I had to uh, um, if I had to to to, to sort of reduce it down to a couple of words it would be it would be it would be uh, uh, rustic and robust but in a, in a very good way um, uh, the vineyard the vineyards on north facing terraces and just in the lee of the Teviot Dale ranges it's a, which just nicely shelters it from the uh, from most of Wiper from the from the sea and gives them a very dry uh, uh, manageable ripening period in most years. Um, a, a large proportion of the vines are, are on their own roots, not grafted to the rootstock, which means they're susceptible to attack from from uh, uh, from phylloxera, a little bug that attacks the roots and, and requires defense by, you have to 
uh, graft them onto flocks or resistant roots. Uh, so they no doubt will get hit uh, sooner or later. But there's a, a, a strong belief that in the wine world that own roots, wines on their own roots are better than grafted wines. So that's uh, an interesting feature of, 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 uh, of, their, uh, of their wines. Uh, they use a one third whole bunch in the ferment to, it's with the fermenting with the stems and uh, to uh, extract more tannin and to give the wine more more uh, more spice and more longevity too often um, makes it more interesting and they spend 18 months which is quite a long time in Burgundian bariques 40 percent of which were new let's have a look Always got a decent amount of colour with uh, Pegasus Bay. They always seem to to get uh, plenty of extract, plenty of colour. Hmm, quite a lot going on on the aroma. Oh yeah, so it's a flavour-packed wine, um, rich and complex. I get plum, sort of wood smoke, uh, licorice, mixed spice, cedar, nutty oak. Um, quite lots of layers uh, ha happening there. Uh, it's um, quite quite uh, a not noticeable structure of tannins, but they're not they're not hard tannins. They're they're, they're rounded tannins, which which I think will. Help the wine to age gracefully. Certainly, past vintages have; they've got a reputation for aging extremely well, and um, uh, without compromising its early approachability. What is it? 2017. So um, it's uh, uh, already uh, easy to enjoy. Um, I gave that 95 points, uh, which scored at number three out of 20 to, from of 2017 Pinot Noirs from Canterbury. Uh, and the, the uh, recommended food match is uh, red meats, particularly duck. And there we go, duck again, mushrooms and truffles, etc. Uh, so, uh, and they all sound perfectly, perfectly uh, good matches to me. Mm. I'm not swallowing, but I'm tasting twice. Now we've got time for quick. Oh, we've got some questions up here. How much does the wine taster's preference affect the score for the wine? Take Chardonnay style as an example. Now that that's a that's a very interesting question. Uh, I I would say that a good professional judge is not influenced by style. Um, you know, my favourite uh, uh, wine is is Pinot Noir. Um, and, and I'm not a great fan of, of uh, cream sherry, but if I uh, discover a, a cream sherry that is, is, is a particularly good cream sherry, I will give it a, uh, a substantial mark to, to support it. So you can't, you can't be influenced. And I don't, think, I don't think good wine critics and good wine judges are influenced by, by the style. They may have a specialty style or a or a favourite style. They always have a favourite style, but I, I, I don't think that would be um, that, that should should influence them. Um, can you put? Oops. Can you just put an ice cube in your Pinot Noir if it's a hot day? <laughs> well, I I often chill Pinot Noir on a hot day, but I don't use an ice cube, which could tend to dilute it a little bit. And someone's worked very hard to produce the, the concentration that the wine has, so it seems to be, me to be letting them down to to uh, put put ice in it. But I just pop the the glass in in the fridge, and it takes no more than ten minutes really to 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 drop it down to quite a few degrees until until it's, until it's acceptable. I am in total support of uh, adjusting the. Of not accepting the temperature as it arrives, of actually trying to uh, modify the temperature to make the wine taste even better. I'm a big, big fan of that. I use the microwave for warming it up, and I use the fridge for for cooling it down. 
Um, so I would try not to use ice cubes. In the I have, I have, I do remember having a particularly ordinary uh, uh, light, uh, uh, unattractive Pinot Noir in a cafe, and and putting, and it was too warm. And I put, I did put some ice cubes in it, and it and it actually improved it. But whether that was just the chilling or the or the dilution of of flavors that weren't exactly to my taste, I'm not sure. Um, hi, Bob Sid Sal here in San Francisco. Oh, good heavens! There's an old friend from way back. I'm drinking a 2015 Surveyor Thompson 2015 Row Five Pinot Noir. A powerful Pinot, but yet with finesse made by Dean Shaw. Could you address the ageability of New Zealand Pinot, specifically from Central Otago and Martinborough? Thank you. Well, nice to hear from you, Sid. Um, I, I think the ageability is increasing. <laughs> I, think, I think because um, Central Otago and Martinborough, uh, the wines are often so approachable when they're when they're young, that, that the people make the automatic assumption that they're not going to, to get better with age. And that's not necessarily true. Um, I've just recently done two vertical tastings, one with Grasshopper Rock from uh, Alexandra and, and one from of uh, Akarua, 10 vintages of Akarua. Um, and I think those, those uh, Wines were improving nicely with age. So, so, and I also think that that in the in the initial in the formative years of of particularly Central Otago, uh, that, that they've built their reputation on wines that are very accessible, and they've they've got the tick from the drinking public now, and and now they're starting to tweak them. Uh, to 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 build longevity and to build greater complexity in them. So uh, I think that that use the use of more whole bunch in ferment, uh, uh, the uh, just the simple fact of vine age, uh, is 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 really uh, uh, helping to uh, extend the extend the life of of uh, of Pinot Noir and Central. I think Martinborough's. Um, Another case, they 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 have got some older vine material, older than Central Otago mainly, and uh, and 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 they already have. Take Atarangi for instance. They've they've really got a, a very good reputation for longevity. You know, they get a couple of decades out of out of uh, a good vintage of of Atarangi well stored. It's uh, uh, that's that's uh, that's significant. So. I hope that helps you, Sid. Thank you. Now we will, uh, let's, let's see what else we're up to here. We've got um, uh, the 2018, I need longer arms, uh, 2018 Pepper Tree Platinum Range Coquan. I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that. Shiraz from the Hunter Valley, uh, and with a tag price tag of Australian ninety dollars. Um, Two thousand and eighteen was uh, for Hunter, the Hunter, uh, an unusually good uh, uh, vintage, a great vintage. I'm told with with no pressure, and and Hunter can have uh, rain during the uh, ripening period that does normally put a lot of pressure on the, on winemakers, but but 2018 was the exception. So that's, uh, that's a good news. Um, Pepper Tree have got 38 and a half he vineyard, hectares of vineyard in the lower Hunter. Uh, and the, the soils are mainly terra rossa clays over crumbly limestone. Good stuff, really. Oak punchins for 17 months. This wine spent quite a deal of time in oak. And it's, it's a blend of the best bar barrels of the vintage. So that every, you get up several hundred barrels, you can taste them, they're all incredibly different. And uh, the, the best wines uh, uh, are obviously used to make the flagship wine in this case. All right, let's have a taste. Certainly got no plenty of color. 
<clears throat> Very deep. Mm, smells great. Mm. I don't think I've ever had uh, a Shiraz that's from the Hunter Valley as good as this. And I've had quite a few Hunter, Hunter, Hunter Shiraz, but this is absolutely uh, spot on. I, it's lovely, rich fruit, um, berry, plum, just layers of, of lots of little nuances of, of uh, berry flavors going on there. Uh, spice, it's got wonderful touch of spice. Um, I get, I'm getting anise or licorice licorice character it's it's uh, a very pure and wonderful texture has just got a um a softness and a richness that that is completely seductive this is a young wine uh, and yet i'd be absolutely happy to sit down with a bottle of that and uh, the right sort of food match we'll have a look at that in a minute uh just just terrific i think this is a absolute cracker of a wine um and, and I think it's got good, good cellaring potential. Now, Nick Butler gave this 96 points and ranking it, which ranked it eight out of 59 of 2018 Shiraz from the Lower Hunter. Um, I think that's just a stupendous wine. It's another one that's having a little battle with myself about swallowing, but I'm, I'm winning the battle. Uh, and the winemaker recommended the match of a fat, dry aged sirloin. Uh, and I can totally endorse that one, just with a big sirloin steak um, and all the trimmings, as they say, be wonderful stuff. Well, so far, all cast iron gold medal quality, I have to say. Um, and then we've got the last wine and the only one with a cork, we've got Chateau Tananda, Terroirs of the Barossa, Ebenezer District, Shiraz. And Chateau Tananda is a, uh, um, a magnificent property. Uh, it was established in 1890, wonderful, beautiful old building that's sort of red and um, relief red sort of you'd have to see it to uh, appreciate it um, uh, and it's in the Barossa and it was bought by South Corp and then abandoned by them and then rescued by John Gaber in 1998 it's now got 350 acres of vines a croquet lawn and a cricket oval uh, and they've also got long-term contracts with uh, with 30 growers that uh, 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 form the bulk of the production. Uh, it's a must visit uh, if you go to the Barossa, absolutely must visit. Um, they, uh, the, the vineyards all, it's got that classic sort of red brown earth on calcareous subsoil, uh, really, really good stuff. That's the, in the, in the Ebenezer district. Um, they've got four different districts of Barossa and that are under the terroirs of the Barossa label. Uh, this being the the Ebenezer. Uh, let's have a taste. Decent sort of bottle. This is. Uh, good cork. Mm, great nose. Really, uh, sort of lifted berries, um, black fruits, and I think it'd be really fascinating to get the four um, terroirs of the Barossa and, and put them alongside each other and, and look at the differences. In fact, that's something I might do. Uh, when I next get over to uh, uh, to Australia, can't be too far away. Um, yeah, it's, it's a really a really lively, smoky, um, 
black olive, uh, just got lots and lots of depth of flavor. Uh, it needs a little bottle age or perhaps a, 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 just some aeration to bring out the best uh, and certain foods to bring out the best too. It's just a, just a lovely big wine. It's, it's, it's big in, in, the, in the sort of tr traditional Barossa Shiraz tradition without being sweet and without being um, overblown with sort of vanillary American oak or um, uh, and uh, too high iron alcohol. What's the alcohol? Oh, no, the alcohol's getting up there 15%, but, it, but the wine can handle it. it it's, uh, it's not showing that, that sort of cloying sweet alcohol sweetness uh, at all. Um, Huon gave it an enthusiastic 96 points, which ranks at number three of 138 uh, examples of 2018 Shiraz from the Brossa Valley. So, and I once again support uh, uh, Huon wholeheartedly on his, on, his, uh, on, on that score. I think that's a, a, that's a fantastic wine. And I, as I said, I'm going to plan to taste it against the other terroirs of the Barossa. Um, uh, that's, uh, I think we've got some more, ah, we've got a, a few more questions, um, which I'll answer. Uh, let's have a look. Does Wiper produce much Pinot Noir? Yeah, Wiper does produce a lot of Pinot Noir and, uh, and very good Pinot Noir too. We've had one tonight or I've had one tonight anyway. Um, but, uh, you, you, you get the difference between the, the sort of hillside, um, uh, hillside, uh, uh, hillside Pinot and, and, uh, and on the plains. So you get the, 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 the more grunty, uh, more intense hillside, uh, uh, wines in the sort of softer, more accessible, perhaps wines on the plains. And there's also some, um, uh, areas of, of quite high chalk uh, soils that, that, that produce another variation again. Um, yeah, so Wiper does produce uh, uh, a lot, but it hasn't got the big companies there that, uh, that, that would feature them on the shelves in, in, in supermarkets and, and wine stores. Uh, one of the key differences between Australian Shiraz and New Zealand Syrah, I suppose if you, you could almost answer that one and, and say pepper. <laughs> um, uh, we're, we tend to be a much cooler uh, wine regions and, or produce Syrah in much cooler wine regions than the Australian wine regions. That's not entirely true. They have cool regions over there too. But, um, uh, and the cool regions tend to produce a, a, uh, uh, a compound called rotundone, which is black, gives a, a taste of black pepper. Um, Twenty percent of people are uh, don't can't taste rotundone. So, if you've got ten people in a room, two of them, eight of them might describe a wine as having black pepper, but two would would, would definitely not. Um, so, so I think that's that's. I think New Zealand Pinot Noir is probably close to the French model than Australia. In fact, I think it's quite. It's quite useful having uh, a different name for it, Shiraz versus Syrah. I think I think it's um, uh, it, it 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 underlines the differences that 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 do do uh, are evident in in the wines of, of both um, of both uh, countries. Let's have a look. Uh, can you detail how you allocate? using the 100 point system. Detail how you allocate using the 100 point system. Well, it, it, the 100 point system's no different to the 20 point system or uh, any other point system. Uh, it's just you know, 95 or more uh, are gold and um, 85 and above uh, silver, 85 to 94, I suppose, um, silver and um, below, oh, 80, no, I said 85, 90 to 95 are, um, 90 to 94 are silver and uh, 85 to, um, uh, to 89 are, are bronze and below that there's no award. So that's, that's really it. That's, it's the same if you divide by five and you get 
a similar thing for the for the 20 point system. Um, what factor has the biggest impact on making a gold ribbon wine? Is it the weather during vintage? Um, gee, because that's a hard thing to say. I mean, the most important factor is planting the right grapes in the right spot to start with. Uh, and then vintage conditions or weather conditions are going to, are going to have an ongoing influence uh, vintage by vintage. So I, I would say, no, I think the most, the most, uh, in, in, the biggest impact is, or the most biggest contributor to gold medal quality, potential quality is, is site. Uh, and uh, it, it, it's, it, we, it's clearly evident. You, you, you can see high quality producers earning gold year after year, um, despite the, uh, despite the, um, uh, vintage variation in a in a in a tough vintage, they just the selection process comes in, and uh, and they can make uh, um, uh, terrific wines. Uh, I have this one. Uh, I was recall in 2014 being in Marlborough in the heavily rain, heavy rain, and as a one producer was picking a Pinot Noir, and I thought, oh gosh, the wine's going to. Um, suffer badly in the dilution and rot and so on, um, but the wine was heavenly. And and the um, uh, but the, I talked to the to the winemaker about it, and he said, "Well, yeah, we, we we wasted half, we we rejected half the the fruit to get that quality." So serious players uh, with in the right site uh, are going to. Uh, are going, are going to triumph if they've got that sort of um, that sort of philosophy. What else we've got? What do you think, Bob, of adding Viognier to Shiraz to soften it, as in the Upper Rhone? Oh, Hilton Le Grice. Hi, Hilton. I'm <laughs> catching up with some old friends here tonight. Um, yeah, I. It's a funny thing that uh, you can use no more than five percent. It's just a small amount of of Viognier co-fermented with with uh, Syrah actually fixes the color and, and gives you a slightly deeper color and a little bit slightly more aromatic uh, nose uh, and, and a softer texture. So it does, it does modify uh, the, 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 the wine that you'd normally get if you just carried on and produced a, uh, a, a Syrah. Um, I like to have that variation and there's a few uh, companies that, that do both. Um, Man of War on Waiheke Island is an example. Um, uh, but I'm, I'm told that, that, that customer feedback or consumer feedback in New Zealand uh, uh, suggests that, that people don't like to see Viognier on the label of, they'd like to have a Syrah that's just Syrah rather than they get confused once it, the, there's any mention of, of Viognier. So it suffers commercially, even though, in, to my mind, it, it actually uh, uh, offers a variety, offers an extension of, 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 of Syrah. So anyway, um, and that's all we've got time for uh, tonight. It's lovely to have you all along and uh, enjoy your company, albeit out of sight. But um, And I should remind you that uh, in two weeks' time, we've got Hewan and Amanda Yellop uh, are celebrating with eight champagnes. So that's a not to be missed uh, uh, evening, a webinar. And then a more uh, make an appearance night, uh, a Vinny social dinner at the Fix Wine Bar in Sydney. Uh, it's called Christmas Crackers and you'll find it all about, about it on our website, but uh, that's the first of a Vinny social, a series of Vinny social dinners that we've got on the planning table. Um, once again, Thank you for uh, uh, coming along tonight, if that's the word, and logging in tonight. And uh, I look forward to uh, to uh, have, you, have you log in at the next webinar, which we, we won't be until the new year now. Thank you. Good night.